All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and in rights. That is the first sentence of the first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And for me, this sentence is a very important source of inspiration. Free, equal, dignity, rights. Refugees have been denied their freedom, their equality, their dignity and their rights. And that is why they had to leave their homes, their countries, that they had to cross borders and they had to become a refugee. And what I hope to do in this talk is to share with you some of my experiences with refugees and also with refugee policy, and I'll focus with the policies on Europe. And at the end, I will also give you some maybe advice or a call to action. The picture you see here now is not taken at down the rabbit hole or lowlands. It's taken at Idomeni, a little place at the border of Greece and Macedonia. I was there in the spring of 2016. 12,000 people hoping to be able to cross the border to Macedonia and then to continue to other countries in Europe. It had been raining for days and days. Everything was totally soakingly wet. There was an enormous amount of mud and dirt. There were almost no facilities. Not enough showers, by far not enough. Not enough toilets, no tap water, no registration, no organization. And I've been in some rough situations in my career, but I think I never felt so ashamed as when I was there, because this happened within the borders of Europe. Every pop festival in Europe could do better and has better facilities. After some time, having talked to some persons, it became too much for me, and I wanted to get out of the camp briefly to go to the village, to get a grip on myself again. And when I was walking there to the village, I saw three boys, around 16, the age of my son then, eating an apple. And I said, hey, sir. I said, hey, guys, what's up? He said, well, we were fed up in the camp. And I said, well, same with me, I said. I said, what's your names? The first said, he is trouble. And the second said, he is problem. And the third said, and he is crazy. Mm -hmm. That's a nice trio, trouble, problem, and crazy. Where are you from? They're from Aleppo. When did you leave Aleppo? One and a half year ago. Did you go to school? No, it wasn't possible. Where do you want to go? To Germany or maybe to Norway, if the border opens. We made a small chat, and then I continued my walk to the village. When I came back, they had gone back to the camp, I suppose. I never saw them again, and I very often wonder what happened to them. Are they in Germany? Are they in Norway? Or are they still stuck in Greece? A second encounter. A second encounter is with Marwa Aboud, a young woman from Syria. She had told us her story, how the bombs had hit her house, how she had to look for her brother and sister, and how she finally found their remains, how she had to escape the fire, how their family had to run away, how they had to travel dangerously through Turkey in the back of a van, how they were on the Mediterranean, fearing that they would drown, how they made it to Greece and then came in a camp situation where nothing was arranged, and finally, how they made it to the Netherlands. When I met her in Amsterdam, Marwa, I asked her, did you come by bike? And she said, driving a bike in Amsterdam? Way too dangerous. <laughs> what I'd like to tell you now is that if you are a refugee, then is it, I talk to many people, I talk to many people in Lesbos, in Sicily, in Lampedusa, in Idomeni, in Athens, and they told me why they came and how they came. They told me why they came, because of the civil war, of the violence, of atrocities, of cruelties, because of repression like in Eritrea. They also told me how they came, how they were beaten, kidnapped in Libya, how the boat where they were in suddenly started deflating on one side and all wanted to clamp to the other side in order to be safe how the boat capsized, 
and a young man told me how he could climb to a piece of wood and see his friend 40 meters away drowning and couldn't do anything to help her. And of course, I asked all those people, but were you aware of the dangers of crossing the sea? Were you aware how dangerous it could be? And they all said, yes, of course we knew, of course we heard, we knew, we realized how dangerous it would be, but staying home was not an option, was not an option for us. So, if staying home is not an option, and you change of a citizen into a refugee, what are then the responses by receiving societies? In Europe, we saw over the last decades, we, we saw many more refugees coming to our countries, from other countries, different backgrounds, different cultures. And the reaction of governments in the 90s was about the same everywhere. We need to be more tough. We need to be more restrictive. We need to be more deterrent. Then European countries realized that they had to build a common European asylum policy, and they started doing that. And after that, the Arab Spring came, the Arab Spring, and also the civil war in Syria developed. And suddenly many more refugees came again to Europe. Many more refugees. And they just continued walking through Greece, through Macedonia, through Serbia, uh, through Slovenia, to Austria. The reaction of governments was then not, we need more restrictive policies and laws, it was, we need to keep them out as much as possible. We cannot cope with so many people, and if they are here, we are in trouble. So we have to keep them out. We keep, have to keep them in the region. We have to keep them in Turkey. We have to keep them in Greece. That was the reaction of governments. The reaction was to close the borders as much as possible. What I would like to tell you now is what kind of approaches are there for refugee issues, for refugee problems? And in the core is, of course, human rights, human rights treaties, human rights standards. From this core of human rights standards, you can see four possible approaches, and they should be dealt with in a comprehensive way. The first is reception in the region. It's often be told by many politicians, reception in the region. It's important to note and to know that over 80% of the world's population of refugees is in the region and will stay in the region. It's also important to realize that in that region there is an enormous shortage in resources, in clean water, in food, in shelter, in education, in health care, and also in work. Then to the second. The second is repatriation. Many refugees want to go back to their country as soon as it's safe and they can start rebuilding their country and also their lives. But states, governments, are often very keen, very eager to send refugees back to Afghanistan and possibly shortly to Syria. The third approach is resettlement. The United Nations Organization for Refugees says that 1.4 million refugees urgently need resettlement to a safe country, to a safe place. Safe and affluent countries last year provided 75,000 places. 75,000. Then 1.4 were needed. And the fourth approach is the asylum procedure. What countries now are trying to do is to outsource the asylum procedure to countries like Turkey, countries like Tunisia, countries like uh, uh, Niger, and countries like Egypt. That's a very dangerous development. So, if you look now at those four approaches and the brief sketch I gave, you can imagine the situation where refugees are in. And when I was thinking on that, a very strong image came to my mind. And that is a book that Polish philosopher Zygmunt Bauman wrote about, a book with the title Wasted Lives. Wasted Lives. Lives, individuals that do not care, that do not matter. We do not care about them. It doesn't matter how many, we can simply look away and lives are simply wasted. That is what Sigmund Bauman wrote about. And I wonder if this is something that we want to accept, that we want to accept simply lives being wasted, that we don't care, that we look away, that we turn a blind eye to the needs of refugees. I think this is unacceptable, and I think we should come to uh, solutions 
and improvements. Those are necessary, but also possible. One solution is to really greatly enlarge the contribution for the reception in the region. That's not difficult to do. Much more resources to the region in order to give people a decent life over there. The second is, don't start repatriation too soon. That's very important. The third is, make a larger number available for resettlement. You can plan, you can organize, you can prepare. That's easy to do if you want to do that. And the fourth is, improve the quality of the decisions in asylum and are not too easy on outsourcing asylum. Now, knowing all this, I'd like to point again to you at Marwa Abud. And I would like to ask you, I told you about how she had to leave her country and her home. Please try to imagine what she had to endure, what she had to experience. And also try to imagine that it was you that had to experience that, or that, were, that it was your friend, or your neighbor, or your parents. And if you think of that, try to imagine how would you like others to react then? How would you like others to respond? That is what I would like you to keep in mind. My appeal to you all is, don't look away from the needs of refugees. Try to be involved. Try to make a difference. And I come to three very practical things that you could do yourself. I wonder what should be done, what could be done, and also what could you do. The first is that you could look for projects where you could meet refugees, meet them, hear their stories, listen to them. That is extremely important and also a very, very worthwhile experience. The second is contribute to projects that aim at improving the situation now at the Greek islands. Very interesting, very many projects. And the third is engage in the debate, in the discourse in society, in the discussions. Because in these debate, discourse, discussions, that is where public opinion is formed and that is where politicians are listening to. At the end now of my talk, I want to come back to Article 1 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. All people are born free and equal in dignity and rights. This was, in 1948, the promise. This was the ambition. And it still is the promise and the ambition. This is a world I would like to contribute to and to live in. But it is not self-evident, and it doesn't happen out of itself. So we have to contribute to that. And that is why I would like to call to you all, please don't look away. Don't be indifferent. Try to participate in the debate, in projects. Do make a difference. And with Marwa in mind, I would call to you all, never give up. Thank you.